Hey everybody, and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program RP0. Uh, this is going to start off as a Twitch recap, but uh, we will actually be getting to some other things for this episode. Uh, seeing as how most of the Twitch stream, uh, we just didn't really accomplish much. We are still working on the SSTO, as you can see here. Um, we made a few structural changes to it, moved the tail fins around, uh, increased the size of the uh, protective plates around the uh, AJ-10 engines and housings, which uh, did give us, at least on paper, uh, much better stability in high atmosphere and at high speeds. So uh, FAR was actually very, very happy with this design, which, of course, means the problem is elsewhere. Uh, this was one of probably three... Uh, all up launch tests. We are still running with our eight ton uh, test weight. Uh, we have actually no real problem getting this thing to orbit anymore. Um, it does get there uh, best as it can. We are still uh, staging our engines. Well, we're we start on all the engines. We have a liftoff thrust to weight ratio of something like 1.06, which is a very slow crawl off the pad, but it does in fact get itself to orbit uh, most times. I think we had one failure to achieve an actual orbit, but we were close enough that we went ahead and ran with the re-entry test anyway. But uh, it was operating within margin. And we just, uh, as we go up, we shut down more and more of these RS-25s to kind of stretch our time to uh, Apogee and uh, hope that we can round out the burn just as we cross over Apogee. A lot of this thing depends entirely on just absolutely nailing the ascent. Uh, so that you don't go up too high or too steeply and waste too much energy on altitude when you read really just need to dump as much of it as you can into lateral velocity. So there's our final shutdown. We're switching over to the AJ-10s just to kind of round out the orbit a little bit. We were just a little bit shy uh, on this approach, um, mostly because I, I went too high. Uh, ideally, this vehicle would shoot for a 200 by 200 um, kilometer orbit. We, uh, we overdid it by just a little bit, but it's, it is very difficult for me to pilot and watch chat and be entertaining all at the same time. I really kind of have to, like, pick two, doing all three. Yeah, I, I, I can barely walk and chew bubblegum at the same time, so there's that. But uh, we did get our uh, periapsis up to something suitable for a solid re-entry test. We will now jettison our 8-ton test weight. Dunk. There it goes right to the back of the bay, because we're still running the engines, of course, but uh, the thrust-to-weight ratio on these AJ-10s is abysmal. So we'll just uh, rotate the craft around and try to displace ourselves below it so that we can actually eject it from the cargo bay and not have to deal with its extra eight tons of lead as we uh, make our re-entry approach, which uh, we just uh, sped around to uh, uh, Apogee and are going to give ourselves a, a little bit of an Apogee kick to bring that perigee up to something that we would like for a, uh, a solid re-entry test, because uh, that was really the whole point of the last like three live streams, was uh, just trying to figure out if we could make this thing safely re-enter. So we will time warp around until it's just about time to hit Atmo, and we'll start to bring our nose down just a little bit. I mean, a whole lot of it. But uh, thankfully, having this FAR window gave us a, a lot of very good information as far as how to go about making our approach. When really, we get uh, a lot of um, high AOA, large side slip when our nose is above about 20 degrees once we get into atmosphere that actually matters. And uh, just having that window available to us uh, helped us keep a very stable flight path uh, as far through the re-entry pattern as we actually got this time. All spoilers aside, uh, we're actually coming into nominal atmosphere at this point. This is 115 or so uh, kilometers altitude. We're just using time warp or physics warp because uh, we could it actually kept its nose pointed in the correct direction, and uh, once we start to get uh, overheat indicators uh, on the body of the spacecraft, we will angle that nose down and hopefully maintain a solid glide slope. Uh, at least, I don't know, nice and steady, slow and easy, that was what we were going for here. 
uh, of just a very nice, gentle re-entry and hopefully no spins, no terrifying things. It's the uh, first of our ablative struts burning off right there, which was uh, completely expected. There's two more struts towards the back of the spacecraft, which we fully expect to uh, burn off at some point. There's our second ablative strut. And why those two don't go at roughly the same time, I guess I, I don't quite understand, but you know, I thermal physics in KSP has never been uh, entirely accurate, although it is becoming the bane of my existence. So we're, uh, we're starting to show good heating across uh, most of the body of the spacecraft at this point, although it's absolutely nothing to worry about. Uh, our rate of descent actually did start to uh, mellow out. We are not falling nearly as fast as we were, I guess, initially. And it, it will start to taper off. We will actually start to climb and gain some altitude again, which is exactly what we want because that energy uh, for us to glide upwards is uh, not energy that's carrying us forwards. And as I've mentioned many times on the live streams, this craft comes in at a dry weight of uh, almost 300 tons. I think it's like 268 tons of uh, dry mass. Uh, we probably are carrying few extra tons of uh, aerosene and nitrogen tetroxide for powering our thrusters and our AJ-10s. So I just kind of rounded up and assumed that we we're operating at about 300 tons, which is the absolute heaviest thing that we've ever tried to bring back through the atmosphere. And there's our large AOA side slip. So we'll just nose, uh, inch the nose down just a little bit. Uh, somewhere about 19 degrees is safe. 20 degrees is not. So the more nose up we can get, the better our chances of uh, climbing, gaining altitude, and using that uh, belly of the spacecraft as a big air break. And uh, that angle will also push us up, which again, energy going up is not energy going forward, and we need to displace a lot of energy since we have a lot of mass to slow down. And uh, <laughs> that has really become the biggest problem, uh, re-entry rated things with a lot of mass behind them. I don't know. There's some math here that I don't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> but uh, we are actually climbing now, which is a huge relief to see that we made it through that first skip of the atmosphere, both without uh, spinning out of control and without burning off anything that we didn't intend to burn off, which is good. But the, uh, the skip is short-lived and we start descending again very soon which uh, now we'll start to see even more thermal effects. As we get lower into the atmosphere, uh, it looks like we're just going to try to skip all the way across the Pacific Ocean and uh, maybe be able to put this down somewhere uh, in the continental United States, maybe Mexico. Florida would be great. That was the plan. There's our another large AOA side slip. So we'll just inch the nose down a little bit. And it goes right away. Large AOA side slip warning comes back up. Nominal. So I think if we can keep the nose below 20 degrees, we should have uh, excellent stability, which is surprising, I guess. Finally have the stability formula worked out, which was really haunting us for a very long time, but I guess it was just a mask for um, the other serious problem that we have with the spacecraft, which is, of course, uh, thermal loading. Um, it's been rather persistent, and it did kind of show up a bunch during the first phases of re-entry testing for this, is that uh, heat magically affects things that it really shouldn't. You see this bottom row of RS-25s giving us overheat warnings, even though they should be completely isolated from the airflow. We're also getting heat warnings on our uh, fairing. These are the two ablative struts towards the top that are about to go off, and then we lose a fairing and then the rest of the spacecraft. It's the, uh, the fairing bodies that are destroying themselves and can't deal with the thermal load, which is kind of a fatal flaw, unfortunately. So we will turn our attention to other things, but uh, just briefly while we're getting the first stages of stuff built here for this project, I will tell you that I am putting a pause to the SSTO development, at least on, um, these episodes. I will probably, well, I am currently still working on an SSTO project. The project is not dead. I will probably not be live streaming it for the Wednesday live show, although I might start uh, streaming it other times. Um, that's still 
speculative, so I don't want to make any promises there. But uh, I have not abandoned it. I am working on it. I just want to be able to progress the space program forward and uh, work on some other interesting things because we have a lot of stuff going on and a lot of things that I have been neglecting um, because I've been devoting all of my development time to the SSTO project and nothing else. But uh, one of the things that I have been meaning to work on is the uh, next phase in the Tremonia station and its uh, deployment. Um, many of you have speculated on what we're doing with it next, and we are, in fact, going to try to uh, ship it out and put it around the moon and use it as not only a fueling depot, but a crew depot for our uh, scientific crews down at uh, Rosalina Memorial Station. But uh, displacing such a large station is not going to be easy. And really, I figured the biggest thing that we can put in orbit to uh, do that sort of thing is this B upper stage from a DN6. Uh, we just need a means to attach it to the station and get it docked and make sure it stays fueled. Uh, we know for a fact we can put one of these um, B upper stages in orbit completely untouched. We've done it with our Mars missions. We've done it with uh, a lot of other high tonnage uh, lift to orbit capacity things. We just need a means to attach it there and do the rendezvous and docking, which is all of this stuff that I've built on top of the fairing is basically a pressurized fuel tank to feed those four AJ-10s. We have a core flipped upside down that we'll be using to pilot it basically backwards. We are going to upgrade our thrusters because this thing, all on its own, comes in at like 320 some odd tons fully fueled, which will be just about the heaviest thing we've ever tried to dock to anything else in the history of the space program. So uh, a lot of a lot of thrusters, high-powered ones, will be needed to move this just about anywhere, especially trying to pull a docking maneuver with it. And uh, even when it's docked, if we manage to get the alignment correct, we might be able to use these AJ-10s to aid in the orbit maneuver or the uh, circularization maneuver around the moon, which is what the last mission to Tremonia that drive section delivered. So I'm relatively happy with the uh, Delta V stats on this. We just have to fuel the B upper stage and kind of see what we're looking at. But we're going to need a crew. So we'll of course load up our trusty uh, SKS shuttle and get rid of that old drive module from the, its last mission. Now, uh, the primary goal here is to, uh, we're going to bring the crew up first. Uh, this is going to be a liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen tank. Uh, one, it's going to help compensate for boil off. Two, it's going to help give us uh, maybe the extra runtime on that HG3 that we might need to uh, provide ejection uh, to the moon, which would be great to have. Although, of course, the shuttle will not be going with them on that journey. The crew is necessary to uh, attach the struts um, the KIS, KAS struts that will be necessary to provide stability and, you know, secure the whole thing together since we are attaching a fairly powerful engine to a very large and uh, multi-faceted, multi-piece structure. So it would be nice to make sure that we can secure all the things. So uh, we are going to give this uh, tank uh, independent control so that we can dock it ourselves or it can dock itself, uh, some radiators to help keep the fuel cold, uh, of course thrusters at aerosene tank, it already has a control core down at the bottom that's left over from the previous drive module, uh, so we can dock it to the station when necessary. We're going to give it some fuel cells to make sure that it can keep itself operational, should probably title this something different give it a good save file, and then uh, these crates, which I don't know why they get shifted over like that. It is a little disturbing, but we're going to just load them up with KIS struts because I there is a lot of other things on Tremonia Station that I would like to rigidify, I guess is the, the word I'm looking for. So we'll just load up two cr crates with struts and then, of course, click the wrong thing and detach the entire shuttle, whatever. We got it back. We'll just uh, make sure to not do this anywhere near anything that can be clicked on things. Anyway, uh, a full complement of struts and hopefully a crew that knows what to do with them. So we'll save these, get these all in the build list after maybe some standard struts. But 
those are all upcoming missions for our program. But that's going to do it for this recap. Thank you so much for hanging out, everyone. I really do appreciate it. And I will see all of you in the next one. So until then, see you later.